There we go. All right, welcome everybody to this report launch for the Universal Secondary Education in the Asia Pacific Project. My name is Will Smith. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Edinburgh and the Project PI. I'm really excited to get to this report launch. This has been a long time in waiting as many of your work, I'm sure, um, was affected by the pandemic. So was this project. So this was initially hoping to be done about a year ago and it's been delayed and we're excited to finally really see the full output. So our report we're launching today is Barriers to Secondary Education in the Asia Pacific Region, a scoping review of four countries. Uh, in a bit, I will be adding a PDF of the report to the chat, um, but I'll also be sharing a link where you can download the full report yourself. So today, I'll talk very briefly about the project background and importance, but the majority of today, I really want to get into our four case studies. So we have excellent case study from local partners in Bangladesh, from Lao PDR, Mongolia, and the Philippines. I'll ask our conclusion chapter authors to talk a little bit about some of the barriers to secondary education and really how these are complex and intersecting and what that means for trying to address them. And then we'll have a pretty open question and answer session or hopefully you're able to engage, ask questions to any of our uh, presenters or myself. And as we go along, you can ask questions in the chat box, or when we get to the question and answers, I said you can raise your hand. Please do introduce yourself and where you're from as you're asking questions. So our project. This, pro this report is part of a larger universal secondary education in the Asia Pacific project which is graciously funded by the Scottish Funding Council's Global Challenge Research Fund. The idea of this project is to provide a small pool of money to really scope issues <clears throat> uh, within education by bringing together networks from civil society, international organizations, and academia. You can see on the screen here the project team. We've got quite a big project team, including individuals from the University of Edinburgh, the Brack Institute of Educational Development in Bangladesh, the Asia South Pacific Association for Basic and Adult Education, the Mongolian Education Alliance, and UNESCO Bangkok. I want to give a special thank you to our project assistants, Yu Zen Sheng, and our research assistant, Antonia Voigt, for all their work. So why do we care about universal secondary education? Well, first, it's well known that secondary is really one of those key points. It provides access to higher education, but also additional opportunities in life, including employment. The SDGs had this big shift beyond primary education. When we looked at the Millennium Development Goals and EFA goals, the focus was really on primary, and now we've got lifelong learning, including secondary. When we look at SDG indicators, including SDG 4.1.2 and 4.1.4, we see a focus on completion at all levels, including secondary, and out of school rates at all levels, including secondary. However, last year we still saw nearly 200 million secondary age children out of school. And we're looking at our introduction chapter. This is still a concern in the Asia Pacific, which one of the higher out of school rates in the world. So we can see Sub-Saharan Africa left, but Asia Pacific still has three out of 10 upper secondary school age children out of school. If we look at our historic rates of change, we can see that if we continue doing what we're doing, we are going to fail to reach the SDG goals. Our calculations suggest that Bangladesh and Lao PDR will not reach universal lower secondary enrollment by 2059. And that if we look across the region, one in four countries will not reach universal upper secondary enrollment by 2084. So this project wants to know what can we do? What are the barriers? How do we overcome them? So it has three main research questions. One, 
how are countries in the Asia Pacific region adapting to ensure that universal secondary education is met? This is different than prior global goals. So countries are often having to change their approach and focus more on secondary education. Number two, what are the political, cultural, structural, and economic barriers to universal secondary education in the Asia Pacific region? And the final one, how do these barriers intersect to further disadvantage marginalized groups in the region? We've got multiple outputs you can take a look at. This included from the University of Edinburgh team, a series of recorded presentations to help frame some of the issues we were talking about. This included a presentation by myself and research assistant Antonio Voigt on mapping access globally, followed by a presentation by Sherry Sabetti on education in the Marshall Islands, and then a presentation in June on the role of digital and access to secondary education in the Asia Pacific by Michael Gallagher. So all those <clears throat> presentations have been recorded and are made available on our Comparative Ed and International Development Community at Moray House YouTube channel. And that's also where you'll find this presentation after we've got it up and recorded. Today we're focusing on the full report. Once again, I'll add this link to the chat in a bit, but the full report is the focus of our event today. From the full report, we're going to have multiple standalone sub reports. So the full report has all case studies, introduction, conclusion, and appendix, all references. Um, the full report is about 80 pages long. However, if you just wanna look for the two page executive summary, we'll make that available separately. If you wanna see the comparative data across the case studies, we'll have our data summaries in a separate document, which will be about 10 pages long. And then we're also making sure our case studies are available in a local language. We've asked case study authors what language that is, and we're currently translating those. So those will all be coming soon. Uh, so feel free to reach out to me, follow us on social media, um, send me an email, and we'll make sure that you get the report you are interested in. OK, well, that's enough for me hopefully introducing and framing a little bit of our conversation today. I want to get to our case studies. So these are the exciting pieces of this report. We have four of them and I want to start. Here. Uh, Manjuma. Yeah, there you are. Excellent. So I want to start by inviting Manjuma Akhtar Musimi. Uh, from Brack Institute of Educational Development to uh, meet yourself and share the state of access, some of the barriers, and who remains marginalized in Bangladesh. So, Anjuma, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Will. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon from Bangladesh. Um, uh, so, I would like to start uh, with the barriers to secondary education in Bangladesh. Uh, the, so the very first section that I have started in the uh, report is with this historical context of secondary education in Bangladesh, and I'm not going in details with that, but I would like to briefly discuss about the uh, background of Bangladesh because it is important to know about the secondary educations, uh, about the uh, country context in order to understand the education system in Bangladesh. So. Uh, Bangladesh was part of a Greater Bengal in Northeast India until 1947, and we mainly inherited the education system from British India. And after independence from British rule, Bangladesh became Eastern uh, provincial wing of the Pakistan, and it became a separate uh, sovereign nation, separate from Pakistan in 1971. So that was the history of Bangladesh, and now as of 2016, the majority, which is 92.54% uh, of secondary schools are privately managed, uh, whereas 7.46 government manage. Uh, these are the secondary schools. So most private schools in the country are uh, basically uh, the secondary level are highly dependent on government aid for teacher salaries, and also they receive some support for capital and other operational expenditures. 
So the secondary education consists of grades 6 to 12 for children aged 11 to 17 years. And unlike primary education, which is free and compulsory, secondary education is not. Uh, so Bangladesh has uh, near universal enrollment in primary schools with approximately 95% of children um, aged 6 to 11 enrolled. However, not all complete this stage transition from primary to secondary education is basically based on the satisfactory and nas national examination results. We have two national examinations at the end of junior secondary and also at the end of secondary. And then there's another one after the higher secondary. Um, so from 2009 to 2018, the total number of students enrolled in secondary level basically increased from 7.4 million to 10.4 million. Yet we can see a gradual dropout pattern across the grades of 6 to 10 of the secondary schooling, specifically um, between grades 6 and 8. So due to the high dropout, less than a third of secondary pupils are um, those who are enrolled to complete the grade 10 secondary school certificate. Um, and some, there has been some initiatives taken by the government of Bangladesh to improve access uh, programs such as female stipend program, which is called as the FSP. Uh, this particularly emphasizes uh, on raising the female literacy rate and also ensuring female participation for social and economic development. Then there are other projects such as the secondary education development program. There is secondary education quality and access enhancement project. These essentially focuses on the um, improving equi equity and access. And then there are also two teaching quality improvement in secondary education projects, exam reforms and fiscal incentives to modernize the madrasa education system. Now, if you talk about the barriers, uh, there are a few barriers like the political, cultural, economic and the um, and the structural barriers. If I go with the first one, political barrier, budget is the most significant barrier here and corruption is another important barrier. So Transparency International Bangladesh reported about the nepotism and political affiliations, which are kind of common factors uh, which influences in the recruitment and training of teachers in Bangladesh. And um, they have cited that this is one of the main sources of corruption in the education sector. Then there is lack of coordination among the governmental bodies. Uh, as a result, you know, it is often difficult to ensure quality education. In terms of the structural barrier, children like those who are living in geographically remote or isolated areas such as the river islands or the wetlands, also in the disaster prone areas, then there are specific areas which are designated for the brothel operations and tea gardens. These children often face uh, difficulties in accessing education. Some other structural structural barriers, especially for girls, are lack of uh, cooperation from the local communities. Then there is non-cooperation from the school management committee, which is popularly called as SMC. Then there is also problems with inadequate water, sanitation and hygiene. Um, so in 2020, General Economics Division uh, of Bangladesh, they have cited that a Bangladesh education system sort of suffers from a lack of teachers with professional training and also adequate knowledge on their subject and pedagogical skills in secondary school. So these are the main findings of the structural barriers that we have been able to extract. For the cultural barrier, um, uh, girls are the ones who actually face more challenges than boys and, you know, happen to stay more in the um, homes rather than in the school. Girls' participation in school is also at its highest in primary schools because we have achieved the gender parity and then, but then it declines as they hit puberty. Some other factors have been attributed for these uh, cultural barriers like distance from home school to a secondary schools. Then there is early marriage issue, teasing, negligence of girls' education from the community. Then there is uh, religious misconceptions, social security, and also disinterest of parents who are not in favor of educating their girl child. The other one is economic barrier, which of course poverty is the main barrier to accessing secondary education as uh, boys are supposed to kind of, you know, engage in income generating activities and support the families. So as a result, 
uh, even if they access to the secondary education, they happen to kind of, you know, eventually drop out. Then again, uh, because of so much of complaints against the teacher that not being able to have, uh, teach properly, do not have sufficient professional uh, development trainings, or even do not have ad adequate knowledge on the subject matters, you know, mostly the students need to depend on private tutors, and which is kind of uh, uh, drives the students to for the private tuitions, and this is kind of expensive for the poor poor households specifically. So these are some of the uh, barriers for the cultural ones. So now the last point, who is left behind? Um, so of, of course, other than girls, studies also show that children who face um, consistent and concerning uh, patterns of exclusions are the first generation learners, children with disabilities and other special needs, street children, transgender, ethnic minorities, children living in slums and in tea gardens, and children of sex workers and nomadic populations. So these are the children who were kind sort of, you know, left behind in terms of getting the secondary education in Bangladesh. So some specific recommendations that we have proposed in the report are providing free and compulsory education, because as the National Education Policy 2010 states that um, it that the compulsory education should be until grade eight, but which is not in uh, implement, implementation yet, updating the curriculum since um, there is a gap in the you know, skills that are required by the employers. So maybe uh, there's a need to review and revise the curriculum for the secondary education. The third one is transparency in teacher recruitment and professional development, since a lot of um, concerns are being raised about the nepotism and also about the quality teachers who are not being able to enhance the teaching learning process. Fourth one, as I have mentioned about the FSP female stipend program, so a similar thing could be you know, also introduced for the boys so that you know they are not left behind uh, in terms of getting secondary education. So this is much for me. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thanks, Minjima. I think you do a good job of highlighting some of the the real structural challenges, the ideas of policies at least being talked about, but difficulty putting them in place on the ground. So, excellent. Uh, our, I, as I put in the chat box, I encourage everybody to take a second, think through any questions you have from Anjuma, either write them down to save them for the question and answer or just add them to the chat box now so we don't forget them. And we'll come back to question and answers at the end. All right, this our second case study today is for Laos People's Democratic Republic. And I'd like to thank uh, Um, Jayaporn and Mark Manns for writing this chapter. Uh, um, I believe you're going to be the one presenting, so I'm going to go over and allow you to go ahead and take control of our slide today. I mean yourself, and thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Um, so we will go with the Lao uh, case study. Um, I will um, go briefly on the background of the country and then next I will discuss the context of the education in Lao PDR and then followed by the barriers that we identify and uh, conclude with the recommendation. So the Lao People's Democratic Republic or Lao PDR was established in 1975. Uh, it is located in the heart of the Indochina Peninsula in Southeast Asia. Um, over three quarters of the country is covered by land area, by mountains and plateaus. It is a landlocked country uh, sharing borders with Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar and China. It is an ethnically diverse country with 49 officially recognized ethnic city uh, with four main ethnic groups, Lao Thai, Hmong Khmer, Xin Tibet and Hmong Lumian. Uh, with Lao Thai being the largest group of the population with 62%. Um, Lao PDR is the country is uh, the country is in the midst of the fast growing region. Uh, recent household survey shows that the national property headcount dropped significantly from 46% in 1993 uh, to 18% in 1929. Even with such a decline, the poverty rate in rural areas still measures almost three times higher than in urban areas. And despite the growth, 
and progress, Lao PDR is still one of the poorest country in Southeast Asia. Now move to the context of the education in Lao PDR. As you may see from the screen, uh, Lao PDR education system is structured into four components with uh, early childhood education, general education, technical and vocational education, and higher education. In terms of the general education of 12 years, it started with the age of six years old in primary education and ends at 17 years old uh, at the upper secondary education uh, grade 12. In 2000, the education law strengthened the emphasis in inclusive access to education that Lao citizens have the right to free and compulsory education without discrimination until grade five. In 2015, uh, when the 2030 agenda and the SDG came into effect, urges countries to promote inclusive quality education as part of the, the renewed commitment with this SDG4 agenda. The government has integrated the SDG goals into the education sector plan to serve as the overarching framework in education programs. And in the same year of 2015 commitment, the education law has endorsed nine years of compulsory education until lower secondary school. However, free education only guarantees until the end of primary education. Um, now we will look at the uh, education performance of education, secondary education in Lao PDR. Uh, although Lao PDR was an early signatory to the World Declaration on Education for All or EFA, MGA, as well as the current SDG, uh, the country still faces challenges in achieving them. For instance, looking at the uh, figure two uh, in terms of the net enrollment, enrollment rate in education by the ASEAN member states, you may see that uh, Lao PDR ranked the second lowest NER among the ASEAN country members with the percentage of 34.7. Uh, and that also means that over 65 of primary uh, education students did not make a transition to the secondary education. Uh, it also has low uh, completion rate in uh, upper secondary education, which is a continued gap from the primary education transition. It has also a high out of school rate with almost 50% of both female and uh, male students did not attend the secondary education. Um, with also uh, low learning income, uh, apologies, low learning outcomes uh, from the national assessment in 2019, it reveals the result of grade nine students that they did not meet the basic levels of science and maths. In addition, the result from the Southeast Asian primary learning matrix in 2020 also reveals the result of grade five students in Lao PDR with their reading skills being the lowest in Southeast Asia countries. With all these education indicators, it shows that there are concerning gaps in the secondary education progress in Lao PDR. Now, let's dive into the barriers that we have identified through our reviews. Um, since we uh, found that many of the barriers that we have identified, they are intersecting. So we uh, will only uh, put each of the barriers, not by the, uh, we do not address it, whether they are structural only, but they will have the dimension of political barriers, economic uh, and cultural, for example. So this one with the investment of education, um, the government of Lao PDR has set a target of 18% of its total budget on education following the education law. However, according to the budget figures, as you may see from figure three on your right, um, on the public expenditure on education in the fiscal year of 2014 and 2015, the spending was falling short of the target to 14.6% of the total budget for education. This financing gap in education investment, together with the lack of free uh, secondary education provide important political and structural barriers that impede the achievement of the national education policy goals and the quality of teaching and learning. 
At the same time, studies also show positive impact and returns to education on wages and career opportunities uh, for individuals that have completed secondary education. For example, we found information from the Ministry of Planning and Investment that in demonstrate data in 2018 on the return of education in the form of monthly income in million gift by education attained gender, geographical areas, which shows higher levels of education has association with higher income for both male and female. And this provide a strong intensive not only for individuals to continue with education, but for the government to strengthen its commitment and investment to provide higher education. Second, we look at the uh, barrier in terms of the lack or shortage of qualified teachers. Uh, this has been identified as one of the main constraints to the provision of quality of secondary education. Teachers, especially at primary education level, have to deal with multi-grade teaching and has been widely recognized as one of the key challenges for teachers in Lao PDR. As you may see from figure four, this is a survey from Lao Social Indicator uh, in 2017. Um, Across the uh, survey result from primary student to upper secondary student, they indicated uh, many reasons for not attending uh, class. One of the, the main uh, reason is the due to the lack of teachers. Uh, and teachers absent is one of the main issues impacting school attendance. Uh, as you may see, over 82% over of Lao students across this uh, all school level up to the secondary level reported on teacher apteism. So attention is needed to empower the teacher capacity to help increase student participation and learning performance. Now we look at the other barrier in terms of location and wealth versus the access and participation. Children from poor and rural communities tend to be educationally disadvantaged in Lao PDR. Economic barriers persist with income generating activities limited in rural areas and family with socioeconomic challenges fighting that secondary school are too expensive. As you may see from figure uh, five, percentage of schools that offer particular grade by location because the majority of Lao population uh, live in rural area with 8% still live without road access. So from this survey, um, it shows that in remote area, it still struggle to provide classes for all grades in primary education. And in figure six, it shows the net enrollment rate across the age of six to 15 years old and above um, that it, it, it demonstrates the disparity grows from the lower secondary level to upper secondary level. Um, so we found that there is a need for more attention to the unrich and the disadvantage. Four, we look at the perceived value and relevance of secondary education. The economic barrier to education are significant since Lower education, uh, lower secondary education has become compulsory as mentioned earlier until grade nine, but it's only free until grade five. It has become more challenging for poorer families to send their children to school. This is a serious constraint for poor families as they do not have resources to afford the direct and indirect costs of schooling. From figure eight, um, at least 8% of students aged 10 to 14 did not attend school because they could not afford it. And with another 10, another 8% not attending because they had to work. Um, also, over 41% uh, of children aged 10 to 14 stated they are not interested in attending school. While 12% uh, cited family reason and two cited school is not worth it. So these combination of reasons such as not interested uh, in school, family does not allow, school not worth it, can help further explain the re relevance of low perception in value of participation in education. 
Last uh, of the barrier that we have identified is the issues of inclusions and equity. Most of the non lao Thai ethnic groups live in remote and mountainous areas with limited access to school, educational materials and resources. These groups tend to make up um, the group of the out of school children and youth in Lao PDR. In many cases, this is due to ethno-linguistic barriers as the official language of curricula and instruction is different from their mother tongue. In addition, most of the non Lao Thai live in poverty. A third of rural non Lao Thai girls have never attended school compared to under 10 of Lao Thai girls. Disparities also persist between uh, different minority groups. For instance, 50% of rural Hmong Khmer boy and 53 of girls aged 6 to 10 were enrolled in primary school compared to only 36 in rural Chinese Tibetan boys and 30% of girls. Um, however, with, with all this uh, reflection on low demand in education, it, it doesn't mean that uh, the, date, uh, the data is representing the reason, the full reason. We find that there are more qualitative data that can help explain better in terms of the evidence. Uh, it could be that families may not see the value in sending their children to school. They may have to work in the field or the household or families find that uh, they have they have concern on the quality and re relevance of education. To conclude, despite all the long term uh, commitment of education improvement in Lao PDR, the country still faces challenging issues around providing universal access and quality secondary education to all, especially among the most disadvantaged children and youth who are mostly non Lao Thai ethnic group who are uh, disadvantaged in terms of the wealth and who live in the remote areas. Um, we have highlighted the barriers and identified the challenges at the system capacity with the political and structural barriers in uh, compulsory education and financial commitment. And we would like to recommend to ensure that education is free uh, to at least the end of the lower secondary education and education be supported by continued investment um, in education. And second, we highlighted the uh, shortage of the qualified teacher and capacity in association with the impact on student participation and outcomes. Uh, in, in this barrier, we find that um, it, it is recommended to strengthen teacher training and professional support to deliver quality and relevant teaching and learning to reduce teacher absenteeism and engage student participation as well as increasing student learning outcome. And in terms of the geographical socioeconomic barriers that we mentioned on location wealth, and access to participation, our recommendation would be to operationalize the outreach services targeting the unrich and the disadvantaged to reduce disparity, especially in the group, the vulnerable group, children with geographical and socioeconomical challenges, those who tend to be left out of the system. And lastly, uh, in, in terms of the perception of the value and relevance of education, including issues of inclusion and equity. These are intersecting barriers that we find that needs to be further strengthened and uh, share uh, by building awareness and advocacy to families, students, communities on gains and return in education to engage more participation and education. I will end the presentation here for the law case study. Thank you so much. Excellent. Uh, thank you um, for your their presentation. And now we'd like to uh, invite up some of our Mongolia case study authors. The Mongolia case study was written by Patrigal Bakyong from the Mongolian Education Alliance and Zhang Yushen from the University of Edinburgh. So Bacha, I think you're going to be presenting. Uh, yes, thank you, Will. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Bacha Gal, uh, in short, Bacha. Uh, and uh, I would be sharing with you some of the highlights from the Mongolia case study. So uh, let me begin with the, um, some historical contexts. Uh, so Mongolia is a 
landlocked country uh, and we border uh, with two countries, uh, the Russian Federation in the north and uh, the People's Republic of China uh, uh, on the other side. Um, Mongolia is has a vast territory, but um, uh, with only population of only 3.5 million population, and it is one of the least densely populated countries in the world. Uh, an average uh, of two persons per square kilometer, um, uh, and it is a nation of young people. Uh, uh, a, about 60% uh, of the population is above, uh, below 35 years of age. So, um, uh, when the Mongolian People's Republic was established about 100 years ago, uh, there was no uh, formal education system, and it was estimated that around 3% uh, of the population above 15 were Ill, uh, were literate. Uh, so um, then um, the formal education system was created and within 50 years, uh, Mongolia was awarded by UNESCO the prize of Nadezhda Krupskaya uh, for their efforts to eradicate illiteracy, reaching the literacy rate of above 80% within half a century. Uh, so, um, in 1990, uh, there was a transition, a uh, political, economic, and social transition from the uh, previous socialist regime to the democratic uh, society. Uh, and uh, in the, the new uh, constitution uh, that was adopted in 92, uh, guarantees 12 years of general education free of charge. But uh, the uh, education law that was uh, passed in 2002 uh, states that basic education, which is from grade one through nine, is compulsory. Uh, according to the, uh, the most recent uh, um, Ministry of Education statistics, uh, 2020 to 2021 school year, there are over 700,000 students enrolled in uh, general education schools, uh, and majority of them, or 93% of them are in public schools, and the rest, about 7% are in private schools. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, um, enrollment in general secondary education, not only in general secondary education, but also in preschool education, Mongolia stands high. Uh, between 90 and early uh, 2000s, there was a decline because of the, uh, that was caused by the political, economic and social transition. But then uh, starting from 2000, the enrollment rate increased. Uh, the, the most recent statistics of 2018 and uh, 19 school year, the gross enrollment rate is at 98% for lower secondary and 86 at upper secondary. Uh, while the net enrollment is 96% at lower secondary and 82% at upper secondary. So um, even though we have high net and gross enrollment rate, there are still three groups of children who are most often left out of secondary uh, education. And these are children with disabilities, rural children, uh, and uh, among rural children, especially boys from the herder families. And the third group is children from poor households, both in urban and rural areas. Um, even though the children with disabilities experience the greatest marginalization among these groups, I wanted to uh, look at uh, the children of rural uh, herder nomadic families 
which are challenged by the structural barriers. So in rural areas, um, uh, the distance and severe weather conditions make it challenging to provide education services in rural areas. Uh, most uh, villages are located over 100 kilometers from away from the province centers and the herd of families live even further away. Uh, uh, on average, they live from 50, 10 to 55 kilometers from the village centers, and that makes it difficult for children to access school. So to, um, to make access uh, less challenging, during the socialist regime, uh, boarding schools were introduced, uh, and uh, meaning uh, the dormitories, uh, so that the children from her the families stay in dormitories to access education. Uh, uh, after 1990, when uh, the when the transition started, uh, the situation was difficult for uh, the dormitories due to lack of financing. And in 95, they introduced dormitory fees. Uh, but then after a few years, the decision was changed, reversed, because enrollment decreased and dropout increased drastically. So the boarding schools are a crucial um, uh, tool or element to enable children from nomadic herder families uh, get education. Um, uh, the, uh, even though now the, the government provides free dormitories for children, uh, there are f some reasons uh, why her the families may be uh, uh, trying to access education for the children away from boarding schools. Uh, this is due to the shortage of number of places uh, in boarding schools, uh, plus the conditions of dormitories uh, are uh, an issue because uh, most of the dormitories are, dormitory buildings are old, they need uh, uh, renovation, uh, but due to financial difficulties, it's not happening. And also, um, um, it is said that approximately 20% of the dormitories have inadequate heating, they lack of wash facilities, water uh, and sanitation health facilities. Uh, so um, this is causing a problem for uh, children from nomadic uh, families. Um, I wanted to finally um, uh, touch upon an issue uh, which is uh, data collection, uh, uh, especially data on out of school children in Mongolia. Uh, so uh, the I can take one example uh, of uh, a study that we did in 2005 on school dropouts, and we got uh, uh, data from four different sources with difference, uh, the lowest providing approximately 12,000 children out of school, but the highest providing almost close to 70,000 children uh, are out of school. Uh, the, this is a, a significant problem because uh, usually there is a um, problem with methodology and also there is a, a confusion uh, between uh, understand uh, confusion between the dropouts and uh, out of school children. So um, uh, I think uh, I'm running out of time. So uh, you can look at more at from the Mongolia case study, uh, you can uh, look at the uh, issue of children with disabilities and uh, 
who are uh, uh, challenged by uh, array of uh, barriers uh, and the other groups. But uh, I will stop it here. And um, if there are questions, I would be happy to respond. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bajja. Uh, reminder to everybody that the link for the full report has been put in the chat. I'll also share that afterwards so everyone has access to all the information because we don't have time to cover it, quite all of it today. Uh, OK, so our final case study is from the Philippines. This was completed by the Asia South Pacific Association for Basic and Adult Education. And I believe we'll have uh, Chona Sandoval presenting on behalf of ASPE today. Um, thank you, Will, for the introduction. Hi. Good day to everyone from the Philippines. I am Chona Sandoval, and I represent the Asia South Pacific Association for Basic Education. For my presentation today uh, of the Philippine Country Study, I will begin with an overview of the country's education policy, followed by a discussion of the key barriers to education and the resulting effect of these barriers to groups of children left behind by the system. Shona, can you speak up a little bit? Sorry, we're having some issues hearing you fully. Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? Is this clear? Is that better, everybody? Is this clear? I, I can hear you. That, that, I think that's a little better. Okay. Sorry, let me put the report back up here, or the launch. PowerPoint will go. Yeah, so I just think make sure you're projecting well and we'll be OK. OK, let's go. Um, the 1987 Philippine Constitution contains a full section discussing the Filipino citizens right to free relevant inclusive, equitable, and quality basic education. Pertinent laws and policies were subsequently enacted to fulfill these provisions in our Constitution. These include the Free Secondary Public Education Act of 1988, which provided for free access to public education. The Governance of Basic Education Act of 2001, which not only confirmed the provision of free public education, but also the implementation of an alternative learning system that targets out-of-school learners. Finally, the EGASPE, or Expanded Government Assistance to Students and Teachers in Private Education Act, was passed in 1988. The purpose of this act is to make private education more accessible to economically disadvantaged children and youth through the implementation of an expanded voucher system. A second wave of reform in secondary education occurred from 2013 onwards. The K-12 or Kinder to Grade 12 program was passed into law in order for the country to achieve the global standard of 12 years of basic education. There was also the Open High School System Act of 2015, which sought to widen access to secondary education by encouraging the delivery of various systems of learning and different types of programs that respond to specific learner needs. Finally, the alternative learning system was enacted into law this year to provide non-formal and formal learning opportunities to out-of-school children and youth with corresponding accreditation and equivalency exams for both elementary and secondary level completers. Although these laws can be considered as significant milestones in terms of improving school access, barriers prevail. A 2016 data shows that there were still more than 3 million out-of-school youth in the country. The current pandemic further aggravated the situation, with school enrollment dropping 20%. A primary barrier to education would be in the area of public spending. Although the actual budget amount is increasing, the allocation as a percentage of GDP and the national budget are below the regional and international benchmarks, respectively. Another barrier is economic. 
the country's poverty rate is projected to average between 15.5 percent and 17.5 percent in 2021, likely near the 16.6 percent posted in 2018. At present, 30 percent of the poorest household in the country has very low capacity to support their children's education. Given the inadequate financial support of the government, learners drop out of school and in many instances are very are compelled to work. A 2011 data pegged the number of child laborers at 3.21 million, majority of them working in Nasardu's environment. Also correlated with poverty is the incidence of adolescent birth rate in the country, which is very high. This is considered as an education barrier since study shows that teenage mothers have a 66% chance of dropping out of school. Other critical education barriers in the Philippines are structural in nature. Three structural barriers that we would like to highlight are the presence of remote schools, armed conflict, and the prevalence of disasters. A key element of remoteness is isolation due to geographic distance, terrain, or travel time. At present, there are more than 1,000 remote, remote schools and close to 100 extremely remote schools in the country. These schools are now being supported through the Department of Education's Last, Smi Last Mile School Program. In terms of armed conflict, the Philippine government has been dealing with one of the longest running communist insurgencies in the world and has only recently come to a political settlement with the Muslim secessionist movement in the southern part of the country. These conflicts have resulted in considerable displacement of students and youth through the years as fighting breaks out in various parts of the countryside. Natural hazards are another concern, especially since the Philippines ranked third in the 2018 World Risk Index of most disaster-prone countries. Typhoons and other calamities often cause children and youth to miss significant school time, as learners are forced to stay in evacuation centers for months or even years. Disasters cause income shocks with families cutting their education and health spending by as much as 25%. Under cultural barrier, social stigma is a major cause for dropping out of school. Members of the LGBTQ plus community, persons with disabilities, and teen mothers often fail to finish schooling because of stigmatization. Bullying in school persists despite the passage of the Anti-Bullying Act of 2013. A PISA study conducted in 2018 revealed that 65% of Filipino high school students are frequently bullied in school. 16.7% of the Filipino population live be below poverty line. Uneven development and significant inequality in Philippine society have produced many barriers to education, and major population groups in the country are adversely affected by the tragic interplay of various barriers. Presently, there are 10,875 geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas nationwide. Many of these areas have peace and order problems, and some are located in conflict-affected areas in the southern part of the country. Who are then left behind? Briefly, I have discussed the plight of these groups of children in my presentation. However, let me just focus a bit more on indigenous and Muslim children. These children suffer from discrimination. They have been systematically pushed to reside in remote and underserved areas, beside rivers, near volcanoes, or along mountainsides. Apart from being hazard prone, these areas are also vulnerable to conflict. With conflict comes displacement, putting education further beyond their reach. The pandemic has aggravated the education barriers in our country, but it is not a reason for government and civil society not to forge ahead. Now more than at any other time, 
is an opportune moment to address persisting inequalities and to build a stronger, more inclusive, and resilient education system. Um, thank you. That's our presentation for today. Yeah. Thanks so much, Shona, for your presentation. So we've had a chance to look briefly at all four of the case studies. Now I'm going to invite one of our conclusion authors to come up and talk about really the areas of overlap and what can we see as some of these trends across case studies. So our conclusion authors were Sotiria Greg, Zichi Zhang, Sari Sabeti, and Michael Gallagher, all from the University of Edinburgh. And I'd like to invite Michael to present on their behalf. Thanks, Will. Yeah, so I'll keep this brief so we have some time for, for questions, of course. Uh, but we're, we were tasked with drafting uh, the conclusion to this report, drawing on the four case studies and our overriding questions for the report. Uh, and we can actually go through a little bit of this rather quickly. So in summation, and basically this is a quote from, uh, from the conclusion itself, but I think it's, it's, it's important to bear in mind that these barriers to secondary uh, education are complex, perhaps not surprisingly. They're very complex. They do not exist in isolation. And in general, they require long, much longer timelines than we would have been normally been conditioned to, to expect for this sort of thing. They have to engage across uh, a range of fields to, to ultimately see uh, development in this space. So they sit in the report across a few different uh, themes, I guess it's the best way to sort of classify them as largely themes that emerged from the four case studies uh, about number one being, I think, history and geography and the, the role of those two things on uh, access to secondary education. So in Bangladesh and Laos, for example, inequity and interest or, or disinterest, perhaps, uh, you know, a, a certain way to put that, whether by politicians or by the general population remains an issue in terms of how secondary education is perceived and engaged with. In the Philippines, education established is in the country as a valued institution, I think in, in a similar way in Mongolia, uh, but also the historical precedent, uh, precedent, not precedent, I'm not sure why I put that, seems to aid in inclusion in that respect, so although there are limitations to the boarding schools that were discussed a little bit earlier on, but history and geography certainly play, play into this uh, as you go through it. Uh, there's intersection of the rural populations, the two traditionally disadvantaged communities, the, the rural populations and or uh, those from a lower socio socioeconomic status contribute uh, to this, you know, th th this continuation of a lack of access sort of historically uh, continues forward. Student non-completion of primary school, and I think this is an important takeaway from the four case studies, and we reiterate it many times in the conclusion, is this need to cast the gaze a little bit earlier on in the process into primary school uh, and the increased need for children in poverty to work to support their family. So those two things, uh, a lot of these issues around the barriers to access to secondary education do take place or begin uh, earlier on. So it's necessary to look a little bit earlier than we might have normally been accustomed to. And so it also suggests perhaps, for example, this idea of working to support families suggests that families perceive schools in, in some cases as an expensive luxury that they can't necessarily afford. Uh, the second theme emerging from the four case studies uh, around dis the discrepancy between the set targets uh, suggested in the SDGs and elsewhere and the local realities about how these are, are implemented. So it becomes a contested space. Education overall, let alone secondary education, becomes a contested space of promises and ambitious plans presented in a time cyclical manner. So it often follows uh, following electoral politics and political party declarations. Once elections are over, many of these commitments and promises remain unfulfilled. So it's this idea of, of committing to the activity being proposed. Uh, so we see in some cases and I think this is probably true much beyond the scope of the Asia Pacific region, but you often see a, a lack of, of accountability in these targets. So uh, along with the economic and political capital leading to a sort of disengagement, not budgeting properly for particular initiatives, uh, the lack of political will to, to enforce or to sort of implement these initiatives, 
So there are need, there's a need for accountability within these targets and proclamations. We also realized too from the case studies that there were no lack of ongoing initiatives around the idea of barriers to secondary education in these regions. Uh, but, and some of these have produced uh, positive uh, results, uh, but it became clear that many of these gains were easily reversed without an ongoing and, and dedicated kind of political and economic budgeted commitment to these initiatives. Again, we're just reiterating the fact that addressing these discrepancies involves a much longer timelines than we're used to, a focused on engaged, valued, properly remunerated and supported teachers. I think uh, that was clear in several of the case studies that this lack of, uh, of commitment to the teachers themselves or from the teachers uh, was emblematic of a, a larger problem and a view of education along the trajectory of early childhood to secondary schools, noting that secondary access is in many ways uh, structured earlier than secondary school. The third theme being poverty, disadvantage, and their devastating effects. That's the, that's the heading from that particular part of the chapter. Poverty persists as a key economic barrier, even if access to education is free. So you have uh, these ideas of hidden costs that lurk throughout this uh, throughout these systems of education that contribute to these barriers. They structure these barriers in a particular way, and they affect particular groups uh, and much more readily than others. So access is uneven, particularly for uh, these disadvantaged groups. So those disadvantaged groups, some of them were enumerated in many of the case studies, but uh, for example, ethno-linguistic minorities, indigenous communities, their lack of participation, whether due to economic reasons or geographical reasons or sociocultural reasons uh, was evident. Gender equality issues in, in various country contexts can complicate and exacerbate disadvantage even further, which is a very important theme that emerged from, from several of the case studies. Disabled students, for example, excluded from the same opportunities for education. You see groups that were that have been uh, marginalized to some degree uh, continuing to be marginalized in terms of access to secondary education. Now, in terms of what to take away, uh, many of the case studies offered very salient, very, very uh, important uh, recommendations for what can be done. But seeing it a little bit more broadly in the conclusion, uh, recognizing that some of the themes were around slow change, uh, committed action, and learning from each other, however uh, simple that might sound. Uh, holistic responses are critical here, so secondary education cannot be lifted out of the complex structure in which it is uh, enacted. I think that's important. It's firmly embedded in larger systems, whether economic, political, social, cultural, or, or beyond that, and uh, dealing with that complexity uh, is necessary for a particular solution. Committed action across longer timelines. Again, I've mentioned that like three times already, but it's important. This conclusion has repeatedly drawn attention to the need for positive, slow, and largely irreversible change. And some of that involves building accountability into these systems. And context-specific initiatives that might serve as inspirations or springboards for rethinking how we might solve the problems and barriers to access. There are initiatives in each of these countries presented in these case studies that might serve uh, as inspiration or springboards for, for future thinking. So it's critical that we sort of surface those and learn from each other uh, as best as possible. And I think that's me. Will, I'll stop there. Excellent. Thanks, Michael. I really appreciate you and the conclusion authors being able to take a step back and look at a slightly different, broader view of barriers in the region. So, all right, well, we have, we are now on to the question and answer section. We're gonna get started in a second with panel questions. Um, but as we are getting to this first set of questions, if you have questions, I'd encourage you again to add them to the chat box or following our panel questions, please do raise your hand and ask them directly. You can ask them to the whole panel or you can ask them to specific case study authors. So I would like to uh, ask our case study authors to, I'm gonna ask for volunteers to address these so I won't have the entire panel addressing all panel questions. So think about, there'll be two questions, which one do you really wanna talk about? Uh, now, so I'm gonna start by 
asking our research assistant, Antonia Voigt, to unmute herself and ask our first panel question. So the first question is, in your opinion, which one of the barriers highlighted in your chapter needs the most urgent attention and from whom? All right, thanks, Antonia. Um, so I cannot see screen, so please do either just unmute yourself and jump in or raise your hand. For our case study authors, who wants to jump in? Yeah, Manjuma. Um, hi, Antonia. Thank you for your question. Um, in my case, I think I would go for a budget allocation to education since um, education in Bangladesh is underfunded. And if you look at the budget allocation uh, in South Asia, we will see that, you know, within South Asia, the country has the second lowest education budget and also lowest allocation for education as a share of the GDP. Um, in 1990, we had the budget which was around 1.6% of the GDP, and like yet in 2019, it's only 1.3% of GDP. It's dedicated for education uh, placing in Bangladesh. So, kind of, you know, it's placed in Bangladesh just only above the Central African Republic. So, I think this needs urgent attention, and also, I think government support is, of course, needed. Thank you, Antonia. Thanks, Manjuma. Do we have any other case study authors who want to spend a little more time talking about which one barrier specifically do you think needs most attention urgently? Yeah, Will, if I can come in. Yes, definitely, Renee. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. This is uh, Renee Raya from ASBE, and uh, I will be responding to some of the questions. Uh, but first, I have to acknowledge uh, the team that really work on the case study in the Philippines. That's Jonah, who is our lead uh, researcher, Leigh Santiago, who assisted uh, both of us and myself and Freya guiding this project. Now, so when it comes to the key barrier, I would say that as presented by Jonah earlier, uh, clearly it identifies poverty as a key barrier uh, and I think most of the country studies also indicated uh, poverty as a major, if not the key barrier uh, to secondary education. And in the case of the Philippines, this has been exacerbated by disasters, by armed conflict, and by geography, uh, because the Philippines is an archipelagic country. And so that makes it even more difficult to have uh, access or for those living in very remote areas. And of course, poverty is highly linked to discrimination, to abuse, to malnutrition, and also teenage pregnancy, which are the, you know, contributes largely to the increasing number of dropouts from secondary education. And of course, these are made worse by persisting inequities, exclusion, you know, some of the schools, or probably most of the schools are gender blind, and uh, equity insensitive, you know, uh, being insensitive to the plight of the poor, uh, could not understand why, you know, they just have to cross the street and still they miss or drop out from school, no? So it's really understanding the complexity of poverty and it's not just you know, providing schools, no, but really providing the uh, inspirational and encouragement in order to uh, uh, hold on and uh, stay in school. So it's really a challenge uh, for the entire government. Uh, it's not only for the education ministry, but also for the finance uh, department uh, to make sure no, that uh, we implement the guarantees for free quality education for everyone, no? and that there are no hidden costs, uh, no added financial burden, no? and uh, also addressing the incidental cost of uh, education. Uh, so uh, probably uh, we should look and make, uh, uh, make sure that the education instead would mitigate no, and help overcome poverty. So it is uh, really a challenge for the education system, how to make it uh, an attractive option for the poor, actually providing a mix of incentives to help alle alleviate poverty uh, and uh, improve health and nutrition as well and also uh, provide positive psychosocial development 
uh, of our children uh, and the youth, no? So uh, we should uh, see the school, no? Not only as learning institutions, but also maybe facilities uh, for care, no? Ensuring that uh, it provides a healthy uh, space for socialization and peer cooperation. Uh, so it is also important that we should invest no, in equity and inclusion. And by investing, it means not only uh, financial, but also in terms of policy, in terms of structure, and also human resources, especially uh, that teaching uh, uh, profession. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Renee. It's interesting seeing the connection between uh, your and Manjuma's piece, where Manjuma is looking at the budget investment and obviously tightly linked to issues of poverty. So, Bacha, would you like to join us? Yeah, uh, thank you, Will. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, touch a little bit more on uh, the, uh, what Manjuma started and also mentioned by Renee. Um, uh, I think the political barriers is the one that urgently needs attention, and that's uh, uh, education financing or investment, government investment into education. Um, uh, when we did uh, the education sector budget review in 2013, we said that there are uh, three main reasons that education provisions are expensive in Mongolia. So first one is uh, it is a scarcely populated country with a vast territory. Uh, there are more than 400 villages and every village has a public school and a kindergarten. Uh, and that needs a um, um, uh, budget to, uh, to, to run these uh, facilities. Secondly, uh, we have long, harsh winters. Uh, an average winter temperature is minus 25 Celsius and it can reach below 40 Celsius. Um, so it school facilities, not only school, but all facilities require high costs to heat. Uh, and thirdly, um, an education, uh, the education sector has large labor capacity and input and, you know, uh, salary is high. Uh, Approximately 70% of the school budget goes to teacher salaries, uh, for instance. Uh, so this makes it even harder for uh, rural areas. So uh, I think uh, government investment in education is the one that needs to be uh, uh, done uh, uh, urgently. Uh, we, uh, Mongolia, demonstrated its commitment to education uh, in 2002 law on education. Uh, it was stated that at least 20% of public spending uh, to be directed to education. Uh, and we set uh, a good example and, uh, uh, but unfortunately due to political uh, 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 reasons less than a decade later uh, the uh, article was removed from the education law and we made a step back uh, and um, you know um, if you uh, I mean uh, this is not a magic wand but if you uh, make commitment and increase the budget uh, to the international benchmarks uh, it will uh, make it uh, less challenging uh, for those mentioned uh, marginalized groups to access education. And uh, it not only uh, will uh, have effect on um, uh, reducing or eradicating political barriers, but also the structural barriers. It will help improve the dormitory facilities, for instance, or uh, um, uh, one of the issues uh, I mentioned in the barriers was uh, the hidden costs, uh, as it was uh, just uh, mentioned in the conclusion. Uh, um, so uh, the uh, donations by parents 
even though it is said voluntary, uh, are mainly for uh, those things that can be included in the education budget, for instance, maintenance of uh, school buildings, um, uh, school supplies uh, are usually uh, purchased by parent donations. So these issues can be uh, 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 addressed uh, with a uh, larger investment and investment, especially going directly to schools. Uh, so, um, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bacha. Uh, Mark, I see your hand up. You want to join us? Hi, thanks. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, thank you, Will, uh, and uh, just greetings to everyone. Uh, I was uh, the co-author with uh, UM uh, for the Lao PDR case study, so I'll, I'll just add a few comments here. Uh, I echo and repeat uh, the, the importance of investment uh, in education, as all the previous case study authors have mentioned. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to highlight, of course, though, specific to the Lao PDR case studies that uh, free education is only until the end of grade five. And so that contributes significantly to to a potential barrier or, or challenge in in secondary education. Now, in terms of investment, uh, increased investment or, or more efficient investment in education, uh, particularly looking at it before we get to the secondary education level. And I know uh, it this was mentioned as well in the conclusion chapter, but uh, a stronger focus could be put forth in, in building foundational skills uh, in early childhood and in primary school, building the capacities of the teachers in early childhood education and teachers in primary education so that we're we're building the right foundations to, to make sure that that continuation happens into secondary education. Uh, so I think a, a strong investment, uh, not particularly in secondary education, but throughout uh, building up to secondary education is, is extremely important. Um, uh, and, and lastly, uh, yes, uh, investment in uh, structural infrastructure, things like this, of course, in, in Lao, but in other places as well, they mentioned, you know, they, they're hit with disasters. Mongolia just mentioned the, the challenges in, in rural and remote areas. So having proper infrastructure that can accommodate uh, this, uh, having standards or qualifications for what a school really, really needs in terms of, of being able to enable uh, learning to happen in that place. Uh, lastly, um, I just want to emphasize the important, this might actually be the next question, but I thought I would just throw it out there to get it started, is the importance of the community uh, and parents to take ownership uh, and to be involved in the education process. Um, they don't need to be separate stakeholders or separate actors. Uh, parents and community members can be extremely involved at the local level, at the school level, in trying to improve uh, the education, uh, uh, the environment, and what is happening in the schools. So I think the importance of the community and parents uh, was probably maybe not touched upon as much, maybe in some of the presentations, but is extremely, extremely important. And I just wanted to bring that up and uh, to highlight that, and, and maybe others can comment as well. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite our project assistant, Yushin Zhang, to ask our second panel question. We've got about 10 minutes left, so I hope everybody can hang around for our answers to this. So, Yushin. Um, hi, everyone. I would want to know, in the full report, it is clear that many of the barriers are overlapping. And uh, how can the public sector and other actors work together to address these ingrained challenges and improve access to sector education? Excellent. Thanks, Yushin. So here, this is really coming from our conclusion chapter, talking about overlapping and how do we work together to do this. I'd like to since we're running out of time a little bit, also add the question that's in the chat, because I think that there is 
an overlap here with the ingrained nature due to these intersecting barriers and can these potentially structural problems be dealt with through structural solutions? So thinking about coordination, how do we work together and are there structural solutions out there for us? So anybody want to jump in to the second question? I think Mark got us started well talking about community and family and parents. Uh, Will, uh, if I yeah, can answer this uh, question uh, and uh, building on what Mark has already uh, expounded on about the involvement of community, uh, you know, uh, if we are really serious and we have the political will to address these overlapping uh, barriers, you no, know, it will really take the whole of government and the whole of society, you know, in addressing and uh, providing a sustainable solution. Uh, to these uh, barriers. I remember during early in the pandemic uh, when we were debating about whether we reopen schools, you know, and there were uh, arguments that, hey, uh, we can already open school uh, because uh, the science says that the incidence of transmission among children is very low and uh, the incidence of death among children is also low. And so there were proponents to open the school. But uh, the civil society and I think the Department of Health, Health actually argued that education in our context, in the Philippines, uh, and I think in most Asian societies as well, is a whole of society event. No? So it's uh, the whole family being involved in education. It is the community. It is a, a big event. It's uh, almost like a festival, especially in the opening in the exams and also in the closing of the schools. And so the uh, possibility of transmission becomes even uh, more. And so that was one of the main reasons uh, why uh, schools have been, uh, you know, the opening of schools have been long delayed you know, in our context. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we recognize you know, that such kind of uh, 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 <coughs> acknowledgement coming from families, from communities, really uh, provide, uh, you know, uh, is an indication of the high social premium uh, that uh, families uh, accord to education. And I think this is a very good starting point, you know, uh, to build motivation, uh, to ensure that there is participation coming not only from school authorities, from teachers, but also from learners, from parents and the entire community. So I would like to stress the importance of encouraging uh, participation from civil society and also from community and from the learner themselves uh, in ensuring better governance uh, and school improvement uh, planning processes uh, in every school and uh, at the national level as well. So thank you. Thanks, Renee. I think, uh, and, and thanks all of ASPE. I think we've got others from ASPE on here and I think it's a great example of how to pull together multiple stakeholders, really bring in civil society and other partners. Um, so thanks for all the work that you do there. I wanna take a second to actually see if our conclusion chapter authors have anything they'd like to add to this question as they're part of the recommendation that we have intersecting barriers and we need to work together. So I know we have some of the other authors on the call today, uh, Zichi and Shari. Um, either of you like to come in and talk about, so if we need to work together, how do we do that? Where do we start? Yeah, CG, go for it. Hello, hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, uh, so that's perfect. Um, well, uh, going back to this question, uh, May has asked, uh, we uh, in this conclusion chapter, um, in, in especially in the drafting uh, period of time, we also try to focus on dif uh, different barriers such as economic barriers, structural barrier, cultural barriers as well. But when we are analyzing and summarizing from all different cases, we find uh, in general, uh, as the um, analysis presented uh, from the presenters, it has dem demonstrated that the barriers to 
secondary education do not occur in isolation, but um, these um, kind of intersection shows very complex trend. So um, in the conclusion chapter, uh, we focus more on the complexity and the diversity existing in these um, barriers and these um, were small attention. Uh, and um, apart from um, May um, mentioned the structural um, barrier, uh, we also find the intersection of, um, of the cultural barrier, economic barrier and structural barrier. Uh, and we also see that within these different country cases, there still exists um, complexity, uh, even if uh, um, the way um, of the diversity and how the complexity is in intersected. For example, um, in the Mongolia cases, we find that um, uh, some some parents also prefer to send girls to secondary education rather than boys. Well, in other cases, uh, it tends to be different uh, situation. So um, we would suggest that the change will take a long time uh, when we considering the complexity and diversity uh, and um, the cooperation from um, both informal education, such as parent education and uh, boy and girls awareness of um, how gender might contribute to secondary education and also the formal education, such as uh, the cooperation uh, from um, government and public sector would um, uh, potentially help to uh, help us to deal with the challenges. Yeah, so that's it. All right, thank you so much, Suchi, for, for joining us there and adding insight on especially the time horizon it's going to take to deal with some of these intersecting and longer structural. So. OK. Excellent, I appreciate uh, Ursula. I see the, the link there to the latest topical case study from NECMAP and the Jump Center on Models for Citizens-Led Assessments. Excellent, we'll definitely take a look at that. Okay, we're running out of time here, so I wanna to close this with a little sense on next steps. So first, this was designed as a scoping report, and so we're hoping to use a scoping report to identify key barriers for further exploration. You heard a lot of them in today's case studies and from the conclusion chapters, these trends across case studies that are consistent Almost everybody in the most pressing uh, barrier talked about investment and how investment is related to poverty and fees for schools, whether they're formal or informal or hidden. So we're also going to consider expanding this project team into potentially different countries. We need to identify some other venues to share out the report. So if this was interesting to you um, and you'd like to invite either a case study author or the full report team to, to share out and and talk about some of these issues with your organization or you know in a different venue for us and please do let us know and finally in as we're exploring these key barriers obviously we'll be looking for additional funding opportunity to allow this research to happen um, so we're an expanding international cross-sectoral team here if you have ideas suggestions or are interested in getting involved i'd encourage you to contact me um, my email is on the slide but also just add it to our chat here Um, as we're preparing for the next step in this universal secondary education in the Asia Pacific region. Finally, a big thanks for your time today. Thanks for the participation. Um, we'll, I'll be sharing these slides as well as the link to the recorded to register participants. You'll be able to see once again the link to the full report where the video recording will be at. And I'd also encourage you to connect with us uh, via Twitter at at Moray House CID, that's part of the Comparative Education International Development Community at Moray House at the University of Edinburgh, which is a home for this project. So thank you everybody for coming. Really appreciate the presentations, the good questions from our panel, uh, for our panel and everybody for, for joining us today, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you may be. So really appreciate the time. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.
Thank you, Will.